Good morning. How is everybody? I was about to say the noise you hear behind me is the chairman thumping around cleaning drawers, but he has listened to my my request, Advice. my request Advice. that he quit thumping around and doing drawers. Uh, let's see. So I'm just hanging out, waiting for. Oh, there's one set of eyes. All right. Good morning. Good morning, my friends. Hey, there's Catherine, my buddy. Uh, so did you have, did everybody have a, a decent night? The dishwasher is fixed at our house. Um, hey Pam, how are you honey bun? Uh, so that was good news. The dishwasher is now fixed. So we're happy about that. Uh, the sun is shining. We're happy about that. We're really happy about that. So much nicer when the sun is shining and I can get out a little bit. Well, let's see somebody yesterday and I should have written down her name so I could give her credit, but someone yesterday gave uh, me a thought about a digital resource, which is really, really cool. So if you will look up in the show notes, in the title, you'll see that the digital resource is from my good friend Debbie Maycumber over on her blog. Um, and I shortened the, the link, the URL link, because it was really long. She has some free coloring pages that you can download. There's about, I don't know, five different pages. They're really cute and they would be super fun to, to do a little coloring. So, oh, Jennifer Scott, honey, you are my sunshine too. What a nice thing to say. All right. Are you ready to read? We are in a single thread and today, oh, I should have marked my spot. We are reading chapters 33 and 34. So these are not very long. Uh, one of these the second chapter in particular is really quite short. Um, but today we're going to read and then tomorrow we're going to find out how the story ends. So are you ready? All right. Chapter 33, Evelyn Dixon. It was seven o'clock on a rainy Wednesday in late winter, too late for Christmas shoppers and too early for tourists. All the downtown shops, including mine, had shut out their lights and locked their doors. Rob had left his keys and his cell phone inside the locked shop. I was tired and just wanted to get back to Margot's and told Rob he could drop me off and then borrow my keys, but he absolutely insisted that we retrieve his phone before he took me to Margot's. The whole thing was ridiculous, but he'd already had a rotten day. I didn't want to make it worse by arguing. Walking in the dim light while groping in my purse for the shop key, I tripped on a loose cobble and stumbled. Rob reached out in time to, catch, keep, to keep me from falling. Careful. Thanks, I mumbled and pulled away. In light of our conversation between the doctor's office and the shop, it felt awkward to have him touch me. I hadn't asked or wanted Rob to come to New Bern, but even I had to admit he had been a big help stocking shelves, installing the new display cabinets, fixing broken machines, running errands, like offering to take me to the doctor's appointment today. Still, he'd been around for weeks. It was time for him to go home. I was feeling better, so much so that in the morning I was going to start working half days in the shop, building up my schedule until I was working full time again and not a minute too soon. I was anxious to get back to work and into my apartment, Stairs were no problem now. I'd have moved out of Margot's guest room and back home a week before, but Rob was still there. Leave of absence or no, wasn't it time he went back to work? And what about Tina? Wasn't she wondering why he was in New Bern with his ex-wife instead of back in Texas with her? It was a strange situation. I'd considered asking Garrett to inquire when Rob was planning on leaving, but I didn't want to put him in the middle. I knew I'd have to talk to Rob myself. And so, as we drove back from Dr. Finney's office, I finally broached the subject. It wasn't an easy conversation. Almost as soon as I hinted that it might be time for him to go, Rob started crying. I didn't know what to think. My big former football player wannabe cowboy of an ex-husband was crying so hard that he had to pull the car over to the side of the road while he sobbed out the whole story. It turned out that right after I'd called to tell him about my cancer, Tina had decided to move out. She told him she was in love with someone else, someone younger and more, quote, fun. And then the next week he'd lost his job. 
A few months before, I'd have danced a jig to hear Rob's tale of misfortune and woe, but I didn't feel that way anymore. I wasn't interested in exacting revenge or placing blame. Mary Dell had reminded me that even in the midst of tragedy, it is possible to find unexpected blessings. Mine had been exactly this, a newfound ability to let go of the past and the bitterness I'd harbored toward Rob. Life was just too short to spend it nursing old wounds. It was true, I didn't love Rob anymore, but neither did I hate him. We sat there by the side of the road with the engine idling and the windshield wipers going full blast while Rob told me how miserable he was. He'd managed to find a new job and was supposed to start at the first of the month, but, in an indus but it was in an industry he didn't know much about. I still can't believe they just let me go after all these years. I gave my heart and soul to that company. And he had, I could certainly attest to that, but it wasn't worth mentioning now. Are you worried about money? No, the salary's fine. Actually, a little more than what I was making before. It's not that. Well, then, what is it? He paused, thinking for a moment. I'm scared. Evie, for the first time in my life, I'm really scared. I can't believe that at my age, I've got to start all over again. I, I'm sure I've got it in me. And worse than that, I, I'm not sure I've got it in me. And worse than that, I just feel he clutched the steering wheel tight and dropped his head while he searched for the right word adrift i guess that's it it's like i woke up to find myself sitting in a boat in the middle of the ocean i've got no sail no oars and no idea where i am i, I don't know what i'm supposed to be now and so you decided to come back to what was familiar to a time when you knew who you were he nodded Evie, it was a mistake. The divorce, I mean. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I understand now what I put you through, and I'm just so sorry. When you called that night and I thought about how I would feel if anything happened to you, I think that's when I realized what I'd... I, I think that's when I started to realize what I'd done. He shifted in his seat, turning so he could see me fully. I was planning on coming up here anyway, at least for the surgery. I honestly wanted to make sure you were going to be okay. But when all this other stuff started piling on, yes, I came hoping that we could get back together. I'd like things to be the way they were before. We talked for a long time. I told him the truth, that everything had changed. I had changed, and so had he. We would always be linked by our child and our memories but we could never go back to the way things were. And though I didn't say so to Rob, I realized I didn't want to go back. Rob stared vacantly out the front windshield, impossible to see anything through the rain and fog that clouded the glass. I guess I can't blame you, Evie. I'll pack my stuff and go in the morning, but I just want you to know that I meant what I said. I'm sorry for everything. I don't expect you to forgive me. And to my surprise, I said quietly, Rob, I do forgive you. This isn't just your fault, you know. There were things we both could have done differently. I'm sorry, too. Well, maybe when the going got tough, I was the one who, but, but, well, maybe, but when the going got tough, I was the one who called a lawyer, not you. I didn't say anything to that. I just wish there was some way I could make it up to you. He pushed his fingers up through his hair in a gesture of fatigue and futility. That's crazy, I know. Some things you can never make up for, but Evie, if you ever need anything, anything at all, I want you to know you can call on me. I mean it. I know we can't go back to what we were before, but maybe we can try something new. Maybe we can be friends. Standing in the dark courtyard and finally finding the key to the shop, I wondered if Rob and I could be friends. After all, that's how we'd started in the first place. Poor Rob. In spite of all that had happened, I didn't like seeing him hurting. He looked so pitiful standing there in the rain. Of course, I probably didn't look any better, but still. I sighed as I slid the key into the lock. Are you all right? Rob asked and put his hand on my sleeve, his voice concerned. Do you need to sit down? No, I'm 
fine, just a little tired, that's all. The safety bolt clicked over as I, tur as I turned the key. I pushed open the door of the darkened shop and jumped, shocked to my toes when a score of shadowy figures leaped from behind counters and cabinets and bolts of cloth shouting, surprise! And it was <laughs> a complete and utterly lovely surprise. Nearly everyone I knew was there, and it was astounding to realize how many people I'd met and made friends with in less than two years. Besides Garrett, Rob, Abigail, Margot, Liza, and Franklin Spaulding, at least a dozen of my best customers had shown up, plus most of the other business owners in New Bern and several people I'd met at church, including the pastor and his wife, whom I'd gotten to know better when they came to visit me at the hospital, and Charlie, who was standing at the buffet on the other side of the room. He looked at me and smiled when I came in, then turned his attention to arranging spring rolls on a tray. It took me a good 15 minutes to work my way through the crowd of congratulants, thanking everyone for coming and assuring them over and over that I had been well and truly surprised until I finally got over to the table where Charlie was fussing over the food with a stormy look on his face. Charlie put as much care into his food as I did into my quilts. He insisted that every dish be plated just so, every ingredient be the absolutely freshest available, and every recipe prepared with minute attention to detail. If it wasn't, he was not a happy camper, and utterly unable to conceal it, his discontent clearly visible on his face, like now. I picked up a spring roll and dunked it into a sauce that was pungent with the aroma of soy, sesame, and ginger and put it into my mouth. The delicate golden crust of the spring roll crunched as I took a bite. Mmm, delicious as always. He grunted but didn't look up as he took a service napkin and carefully wiped off the edge of the tray where someone, probably me, had carelessly dripped some of the sauce. Charlie, I said, reaching out, out to stay his hand and smiling, lighten up, everything looks wonderful. Why don't you leave it for now and join the party? Garrett said something about opening a bottle of champagne. Let me get you a glass. Tonight you're a guest, not the caterer. With his eyes still down, Charlie gave his head a quick shake, like he was twitching away some annoying inset. You're wrong, Abigail is paying for this. Oh, well still, everything looks and tastes fabulous. Leave it, relax and let me buy you a drink. No, can't stay. Just came over to do my job. See that everything is set out properly. Then I've got to get back to the restaurant. I have a business to run. He frowned and as he put a grilled shrimp, shrimp on, oh goodness. He frowned as he put, a, put grilled shrimp onto stripped rosemary skewers and then shoved the skewers into a styrofoam cone covered with more rosemary to make it look like an herbal topiary. Oh, come on, I scoffed, wondering what was bothering him. This was more than just Charlie's usual obsession with serving perfect food. He stabbed the shrimp onto their skewers with a violence that, had it been alive, would have constituted cruelty to animals. It's a Wednesday night in the deadest part of winter. Half your regulars are at this party. I'd be shocked if you have more than six customers at the grill. So stay a little while, Charlie. You look like you could use a night off, I teased, hoping to jolly him out of his bad mood. He stuck the last skewers onto the rosemary tree. I can't. He wiped his hands on a towel and stuck it out for me to shake, and then said formally, Good night, Evelyn. Charlie, you can't leave. The party's just starting, and we've got so much to celebrate. I saw the doctor today, and guess what? No chemo for me. Isn't that great news? For the first time that evening, he looked at me. His expression softened, and his eyes were kind but sad. That is great, Evelyn, really. I'm happy for you. So happy that you're well, but I really do have to go. He gave my hand a quick squeeze and then turned to leave, disappearing into the throng of party goers. Hey, I called after him. I'm coming back to work tomorrow. Do you want to meet me at the Bean for coffee first? He didn't answer. I saw him turn up his coat collar and open the door to leave, the jingle of the front doorbell blending in with the laughter of the guests. Abigail approached the table, took a salmon roll off the tray, and nibbled at it delicately. She was smiling, relaxed, and just a tiny bit loud. Garrett must have started pouring the champagne. Did you try one of these? They're my favorite. 
Charlie is a genius. He is difficult, but a genius. Well, then that makes him just our kind of people, doesn't it? <laughs> Abigail laughed at her own joke, but when I didn't join in, her brows drew together in a line of concern. What's the matter? Aren't you having a good time? Maybe this is too much for you. Would you like to go lie down somewhere? No, I'm fine. It's a wonderful party, Abigail. Thank you so much for going to all this trouble. I'm having a lovely time. It's just that I'm worried about Charlie. Something's bothering him, but he won't tell me what it is. Abigail waved her hand dismissively. Oh, don't worry about that. Charlie's probably in just, just, just in one of his moods. Maybe his sous chef decided to quit, or his suppliers raised, raised the price of free-range chicken, she shrugged. Who knows? He'll be fine by tomorrow. I don't know. I've seen how he gets when things aren't going well at the restaurant, but this isn't like that. He seemed sad, a little depressed even. Abigail tipped her head to one side. Evelyn? I have known Charlie for 20 years. You've known him for one. He's fine. He's just a little complicated, that's all. Trust me. I murmured noncommittally. If you're so worried, why don't you go see him tomorrow? In the meantime, come and join the party. Someone walked by with a tray of champagne glasses. Abigail took two and handed one to me. To your health, she said, raising her glass. I smiled and touched the rim of my glass to hers to my health. Most of the revelers left by 10, but a few stayed to help clean up. Rob, more helpful than he'd ever been during our marriage, carried the leftover food upstairs to the apartment and was in the, and was in the kitchen with Wendy Perkins and Franklin doing dishes and wrapping up the leftovers. I could hear them above us, Franklin's shuffling footsteps, Wendy's muffled snort snort as she laughed at her own jokes, and the decisive clunk of Rob's cowboy boots as he walked over my head. Garrett, Margot, Liza, Abigail, and I stayed downstairs to clean up, wiping down the tables, throwing away used plates and napkins, and, and rounding up the stray champagne glasses that seemed to have been abandoned on nearly every flat surface. Someone had even left one on top of the crown molding that encased the bow front window. It must have been a good party. How had 35 party guests managed to go through 90 champagne glasses? The place was a mess. But many hands made light work, and soon everything was tidy again. I turned in a circle to look at the shop, my shop, and hugged myself. Thank you, I said. Thank you all so much. I can't imagine how I can ever repay you, but I want you to know that if I ever have the chance, I'll try. It was a nice party, wasn't it? Margot said with a smile, her eyes sparkling. Everyone had a good time. Yes, but I'm not just talking about the party. I'm talking about everything. I spread my arms wide. I'm talking about this, cobbled court quilts, my dream come true. Back when I first opened, Charlie told me that I needed to think out of the box to dream about what I truly wanted the shop to be. And this, this is exactly what I imagined. Something more than a quilt shop, a community, a neighborhood where people would come together to quilt and create and learn and heal and take risks. This is what I wanted. I laughed with pleasure, so delighted with everything I saw around me that unexpected tears started in my eyes. And none of this would have happened without all of you. I wanted to open a quilt shop that would help others find all those wonderful things, but I never realized that I'd find them for myself as well. Thank you, I repeated, looking into the faces of my precious son and three dear friends. The sparkle in Margot's eyes faded. I saw her bite her lower lip the way she always did when she was trying to figure out how to say something that she didn't want to say. I held up my hand to stop her. Margot, it's all right. I've seen the cash flow statements. I know. We're going to have to close the shop. Ever since I'd asked Margot to bring the books over to her house so I could look at them three days before, I had known it was over. This was just the first time I'd actually said it out loud to myself or anyone else. I took a deep breath, composing myself. But it's okay. I want you all to know that. Of course, I wanted the shop to succeed, and in every way but financially, it did. In a few months, this place will be empty. 
with two failed businesses to its credit, this wonderful, improbable old building and this terrible, beautiful location will probably be abandoned forever. Cobwebs will gather in the corners, the paint on the windowsills will chip, the plumbing will spring leaks. Maybe someone will come and knock it down to make way for something newer and more practical, a parking, a parking lot or a stack of office cubicles. That would be sad, but even if that happens, all of us and everyone who walked through those doors will remember that for a little while at least, there was something, there was a remarkable little community of people who found something simple and genuine here, and it gave their lives a little more joy. I blinked back tears. I wanted to get through, through it, wanted them to hear me out. If you think about it, that's a pretty good day's work, more than most people accomplish in a lifetime, and you were all part of it. Even knowing how it was going to turn out, I would do it all over again in a heartbeat, but only if I got to do it with all of you by my side. Now the tears began to flow in earnest for everyone except Abigail and Garrett, who had his arm around the shoulders of a sniffling Liza and was trying to comfort her. It's not fair, Liza said. You've been up against so much and you've worked so hard. We all did. It isn't as if people don't like the shop. Yesterday, I waited on a lady who was buying fabric to make a quilt for her daughter's wedding, and she was so excited. She said she would never have had the courage to try it if she hadn't taken your class. Your customers love cobbled court quilts, and you. Margot pulled a tissue out of the pocket of her skirt and used it to wipe her nose. And we were making progress on the financial side, too. Every month was a little better than the last. And every month we added to our customer base. If we'd had another year, two at the outside, I think we could have made it. Liza's right. It isn't fair. I patted Margot's arm. I know. After Quilt Pink, I thought we might make it to the tourist season. Maybe if I hadn't gotten sick and we could have taught more classes over the winter, we'd have been able to squeak by. Who knows? But it just didn't work out that way. It's no one's fault. There are some things we just don't have control over. Abigail, who had been listening to this exchange with dry eyes and a furrowed brow, spoke up. Do you really believe that? What, that there are things we don't have control over? Of course I do. I don't, she said flatly. I mean, of course, you don't have control over things like flood, fire, famine, or breast cancer, things like that, but this isn't like that. If you close the shop now, it'll be because you gave up. In the face of this pronouncement, Margot looked shocked and Liza looked insulted, and me, well, I guess I was a little of each. Abigail, how can you say that? After all we've done, there isn't a promotion or project we haven't tried. We worked our fingers to the bone. We did everything we knew how to do to increase our customer base. I know, Abigail said, and it isn't working. Margot just, uh, uh, and it, excuse me. I know, Abigail said, and it was working. Margot just said it was. So given that, I don't understand why you're going to throw in the towel and walk away. Because I am out of money, time, and ideas. That's why. Abigail made a face. Pfft, ridiculous. Preposterous. Money is one of the few commodities that, in a sense, is nearly infinite. You may not always have more, but you can always get more. Money is easy. Time is tougher, I'll admit. We don't always have control over how much time we've got. But now that you've recovered from your surgery, it looks like there's every reason to believe that you have plenty of years ahead of you. And as far as ideas, she said brightly, looking around at the assemblage. Has anybody got one? For a moment, everyone looked at everyone else, waiting to see if someone was going to speak. Finally, Garrett raised his hand, slowly and cautiously, like a schoolboy asking for permission to go to the restroom in the middle of a math test. Actually, I've been playing around with an idea. Well, go on, Abigail said. Let's hear it. Garrett cleared his throat. <clears> throat> All right, I've uh, been looking over the books, too, and I noticed that even with the very basic kind of website that Margot put together, no offense, Margot, none taken, even with the simple website and no real marketing to promote it, web sales are, almost, are the most rapidly growing segment of our business. And do you know what our best-selling items are? 
with charm packs and fabric medleys that Liza created, especially that chocolate brown and turquoise collection. Customers just love that, the way she puts those colors together. Liza beamed at the compliment and Garrett winked at her before going on. The problem is New Bern is a great little town, but it's a little town. Even if you could turn every woman and some of the men into avid quilters, you still wouldn't generate enough in-store sales to make more than a small profit. The population is just too small to support a, real, a really thriving quilt store. I nodded. It was true. I'd known that from the first. But somehow I'd hoped to attract just enough customers from the surrounding area to keep my head above water. I'd never been looking to get rich just to survive financially while making my vision of a quilting community a reality. We've got to think big, Garrett said, his voice growing stronger now that he realized everyone was tracking with him. There are lots of quilters who don't have access to a local quilt store. If we had a truly first-class website with an extensive online catalog, an inventory that's second to none, where people from all over the country and even the world would be able to find any kind of fabric, pattern, kit, or notion they could possibly imagine, and then have it sent to them quickly, plus unique features that would make our st site stand out, I think we could make it. In fact, I think we'd do better than that. I think we could make cobble cord quilts into the biggest, most recognized name in quilting. He said it with such conviction that I wanted to believe him. I think everyone did, but I still had a lot of questions. But all of that would take money and staff and space, Garrett confirmed. We'd need a warehouse space to house the additional inventory and to give us a place to coordinate order fulfillment. Well, where are we supposed to get that? Mom, I've got money saved. A lot. $60,000. My jaw dropped. 60000 I had no idea. Garrett grinned. I told you I was way overpaid at Claremont Solutions as well as way overworked. I never had a chance to get to, out of the office and buy anything, so it all went into the bank. I've been looking for a good investment, and I think this is it. Garrett, I protested, you are the best son on earth, but what if you're wrong? What if you lose everything you've saved? I'm young, he shrugged. If I lose it, I've got time to make more. Like Abigail says, you can always make more. Besides, experienced computer programmers are always in demand. If I had to, I could get another cubicle job tomorrow, probably making more than I was before. But I would rather work at a vastly reduced salary doing something much more exciting, something I really believe in. Me too, Margot piped in. You're going to need a marketing manager for all of this, and I happen to be available. And if I don't have to live in a ridiculously overpriced apartment in New York, which I'd rather not anyway, I can work cheap. But of course, we'll need entry-level people to help us stocking and mailing and waiting on customers. There are at least a dozen women, smart, capable women who've never been given a chance at the shelter right now who, oh, wrong voice, sorry. There are at least a dozen women, smart, capable women who've never been given a chance at the shelter right now who jump at the chance to work here, Abigail announced. All I have to do is make a few calls and you'd have all the workers you needed. I laughed and held up my hands. As much as I wanted to believe it was true, I was finding it hard to keep up with everything I was hearing. Slow down. We've got to sit down and think this through. Everything is happening so fast. I can't believe this is as easy as you're making it sound. Garrett shook his head. Oh no, don't get me wrong. There's nothing easy about this. I've crunched the numbers and in addition to my 60, We'll need another $50,000 just to get started. 70 dollars would be better. And we still need warehouse space. If we can't find an inexpensive space, that would mean we'd need more, even more capital. I'm not sure where we'd find that kind of money. Abigail stepped forward, about to speak, but a voice from, from the stairs interrupted her. I turned and saw Rob, Franklin, and Wendy standing on the stairs, listening. I wasn't sure how long they'd been there. I've got some money put away, Rob said quietly, in my retirement fund, $50,000. If you need it, Evie, it's yours. I'd like to help you. I didn't know what to say to that. Before I could speak, Abigail put in her two cents. And I'm sure we can find you some cheap warehouse space. Franklin, who do we know that owns warehouses in New Bern? Well, you do, several. You've got a big vacant space 
less than three blocks from here. Abigail looked surprised. I do? I knew we'd bought some real estate, but I thought it was all in Florida, shopping malls or something. <sighs> Abigail, Franklin sighed with his exasperation. I don't know why you even bother coming to our monthly business meetings. Every month we go out, we have lunch, and I talk to you while you pick at your food and chat it er with everyone who drops by the table. Why should I waste my time trying to keep you informed about your affairs? You never pay the slightest attention. Abigail smiled, clearly enjoying getting under Franklin's skin. Franklin, darling, she purred, you do such a good job managing everything that I don't have to pay attention. I only show up those meetings to make sure that you get out of the office now and then. Abigail growled a little and went on. Yes, Abigail, you do own property in Florida, but you also own a good bit of commercial real estate in New Bern. As a matter of fact, you own this building. I do? Evelyn is paying me rent? How much? Uncomfortable about revealing this information publicly, Franklin crossed the room and whispered into Abigail's ear. That much for this old Rick? My Franklin, you are good at managing my affairs. No one but you would have dared to ask that kind of rent for this building and then gotten it. But I've got a better idea. I'd like to rent this space and the warehouse you mentioned to Evelyn for a more reasonable rent. Let's say $10 a month for both properties. Abigail, I gasped, that's too much. Too much? Well, all right then, you drive a hard bargain, $5 a month. No, I didn't mean that it was too expensive. I meant it's too generous. You're too generous. I can't let you do that. <sighs> Don't be silly, she scoffed. I've got more money than I can spend in a lifetime, two lifetimes. I don't need a few more dollars in rent money, but I do need friends. If cobbled court closes, what will happen to our quilt circle? It'll break up, that's what. And then what would I do with myself? Go back to attending dull cocktail parties and even duller board meetings with a bunch of organizations I never really cared about to begin with? No, thank you. Believe me, this isn't generosity on my part, Evelyn. It's self-preservation. I shook my head. It was too much to accept and I was not going to be swayed by glib argument. No, Abigail, I won't let you do it. If my business is going to occupy property that you own, then I'm going to have to pay you a fair price, just like anyone else. Oh, Lord, but you're stubborn. All right, fine. You want to pay me? Then let's do it the old-fashioned way. Let's barter. You can pay your rent in goods and services instead of money. I don't understand. What could I possibly have that you'd want? Your time. I'd like you to go over to the shelter every other week and give free quilting classes to the residents. Every week, I countered. Abigail gave a quick nod to indicate her acceptance of my terms. And the Wind Foundation will pay for all the fabrics and materials for your classes, she rejoined, which cobbled court will supply at cost. Abigail scowled. For a woman who claimed not to have a head for business, she was a tough negotiator, but so was I and I wasn't going to budge. I mean it, Abigail. Either you let me supply the materials at cost or I won't do it. Have we got a deal? She hesitated a moment and then, seeing my resolve, sighed before clasping my outstretched hand. <sighs> we do. That was chapter 33. Sorry, I bobbled it a couple times. It's tough when lots of characters are talking. Ah, oh, my goodness. All right. <clears throat> Are you ready for chapter 34? It's a fairly short one. Oh, but it's a good one. I remember this now. <laughs> it's so funny. I haven't read this book in years and years and years, so it's, you know, it's kind of going back for me, too. Chapter 34, Abigail Burgess Wynn. I'd forgotten my umbrella at home. Thankfully, the rain was now a steady drizzle instead of the downpour of earlier in the evening. And though I'd assured him that there was very little chance of my getting lost or being accosted in the five blocks that lay between the quilt shop and my house, Franklin insisted on walking me home. He was in a talkative mood. It was a nice party, he said, and Evelyn looked very well. It's wonderful she's not going to need any chemotherapy. Yes, I said, and pulled up the collar of my jacket. And Garrett's idea for expanding the business, if that works out the way he envisions, it could change New Bern for the better bring in all kinds of new jobs. He's a very bright young man. Between Evelyn's creativity and understanding of quilting, Garrett's vision and knowledge of e-commerce, and Margot's marketing savvy, I think they might just pull this off. 
Amazing that all the right people would be in the right place at the right time. Franklin coughed and glanced at me from under the brim of his gray felt hat. <clears throat> and of course, it helps that they have a fairy godmother who happens to have an interest in local real estate, wouldn't you say? Hmm? Oh yes, I guess. It is kind of an amazing coincidence. Nothing coincidental about it. Some things are meant to be. I didn't say anything. What's wrong, Abby? Are you still worried about Evelyn? I bit my lip, thinking how selfish I would sound if I told him the truth, but I just couldn't keep it to myself anymore. I had to talk to someone. I stopped on the sidewalk and turned to face Franklin. It's Liza, I admitted. I know it's the right thing, her going back to school. I want her to be happy, but the thought of returning to my old, lonely life is awful beyond imagining. I'm going to miss her so much that it hurts even to think about it. What am I going to do? Franklin paused for a long moment before speaking. and When he did, his voice sounded strange, soft, and oddly hesitant. Yes, uh, well, I've got some ideas on that subject, he said. He didn't look at me, just kept his eyes focused down on the pavement. He cleared his throat. The thing is, Abby, that, well, you and I have been friends for a long time. At least that's how I've always thought of us. I nodded. Until this year, I don't think I had any friends other than you, Franklin. But you're still my best friend. I guess you always have been. I just didn't realize it until recently. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I feel the same. <clears throat> As you know, over the years, I've overseen the creation of scores of successful business partnerships as well as the disillusion of scores of unsuccessful ones. And in my opinion, the best partnerships, the ones that last, are always founded on a basis of mutual admiration and respect. He looked at me as if waiting for me to add something, but I wasn't sure what he expected me to say. Yes, I suppose you're right. He smiled broadly, apparently relieved that I agreed with his point, whatever it was. Good, right, well, that's what I've been thinking, that you and I, well, we respect and admire each other, and in the last year, I, I, I have to say, I've come to admire you even more than ever before. He reached out, took the hem of my sleeve and held it gently between his thumb and forefinger and didn't let go a soft-mouthed retriever intent on carrying home his quarry without leaving a mark. I've always admired you, but you were so determined not to let anyone get close. You're different now. This business with Liza and your friends, Margo and Evelyn, has changed you, and for the better. Tonight, when you told Evelyn that you were going to let her have the shop and the warehouse practically rent-free, and then topped it off by figuring out a way she could save face while doing something that for, would benefit the women at the shelter? He laughed. Well, I've always admired you, Abby, but never quite as much as tonight. You are always generous with your checkbook, but only because it enhanced your public image while keeping you at a safe distance from any real human suffering. Now there are no caveats, no buts, no conditions. You are generous. End of story. Not only that, you're more open with your feelings, more willing to take risks. I shrugged, not sure what to say to all this, but he was right. Something had changed me, or somebody. Uninvited and unwanted, Liza, Evelyn, and Margot had barged into my life and turned it upside down. Thank God. And that, Franklin continued, resuming his normal tone of voice, is another requirement for a successful partnership an openness to risk on the part of the parties involved. And I, for my part, am open to the possibility of risk. Therefore, I was wondering if you... He paused, shifting from one foot to the other as if he had a pebble in his shoe. He coughed, and I saw some color rising in his cheeks. I looked at him, wondering if he wasn't coming down with a cold and thinking that standing there in the rain couldn't be the good for him if he was. But then his meaning began to dawn on me. I was astounded. Franklin, I exclaimed, is this a proposal? His eyes flew open wide and he swallowed hard. Why, does it sound like one? Well, sort of, not quite. 
The more, the more I said, the sillier I felt. His shocked response to my question made me think I'd been mistaken, but at the risk of making a complete fool of myself, I decided I'd better make my position clear. Franklin, I can only assume that in some obtuse lawyerly way, you're trying to say that you think we might want to, as the young people would say, take our relationship to the next level. Is that right? Franklin nodded mutely. I see. Well, if you were going to ask me to marry you, I guess I'd say that even though we've known each other for 30 years, this all seems a bit sudden. But if you weren't proposing, then I'm wondering what you did have in mind. Maybe it's old fashioned, but I've learned the hard way that rushing into, I waited for him to fill in the blank, but he just looked at me. I pressed on, embarrassed by what I was about to have to say and slightly irritated at Franklin for forcing me to say it. Rushing into any kind of intimate relationship before cementing that relationship in law is a mistake. So if that's what you were thinking, you can just put that out of your mind right now. If possible, Franklin's eyes grew even wider. Lord, no, I wasn't talking about anything like that, Abby. I care for you too much to compromise you or your feelings in any way. He blushed right to the edges of his receding hairline. In 30 years, I'd never seen Franklin blush. I didn't know he could. That's the last thing I had on my mind that was any kind of indecent proposal, I assure you. This information should have been a relief to me. In a way, it was, but it was also somewhat insulting. However, I decided to sort that out later. What did he want? It was dark and cold and my feet were wet. I was in no mood for mystery. Franklin, what are you trying to say? For once in your life, quit talking like a lawyer and speak English. All right, Abby, I will. Abby, I, I care about you. In fact, I love you. I have for years. And what I wanted to know is this. He cleared his throat again. <clears throat> Would you like to go steady? He stood there, wet, cold, and pathetic. I'd never seen him looking so handsome. A voice that I was surprised to realize was mine said, yes, Franklin, I believe I would. He laughed aloud and lunged toward me, arms outstretched, but then remembered his manners. He took a step backwards. Abby, would it be all right if I kissed you? I frowned. Franklin, how long is it you, that you think you've been in love with me? Oh, probably from the beginning, I guess. Are you telling me that you've loved me for 30 years, but this is the first time you've ever thought to ask if you could kiss me? I asked incredulously. Oh, I, I thought about it all right. Plenty of times I just never worked up the nerve to actually say it before. I was afraid you might smack me in the mouth or something. Franklin's eyes crinkled just a little at the corners. A whisper of a smile tugged at his mouth. Hmm. I still might. In fact, I probably should but that'd probably scare you off for another 30 years. How old would that make us by then? Let me see. Abigail, shut up, he said, and opened his arms. I did, stepping into his embrace and lifting my lips to meet with his while the rain fell, the fat, heavy drops hitting the brim of Franklin's hat in an insistent staccato, like an approving round of applause. Oh, isn't that nice? I like Franklin. He's good people. Oh, my darlings. Let's see. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. I have a verse for you today. I was, I uh, went back to, back to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. This is something to think about this day. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That was Matthew 6.34, right? So just worry about one thing today, my friends, just this day. I don't know about you, but I, I pray the Lord's Prayer every day, probably a couple of times. And um, more than any other time in my life, I have been praying, give us this day our daily bread. So. Just worry about this day, and I hope you make it a good one. I will see you tomorrow to hear the end of the story.